today to be on the horseshoe. Beautiful fall day. We're here to celebrate two remarkable documents being returned to our university. Both of these documents belong to Richard Greer. But to set the stage for today's presentation, we want to give you some background information. We want to talk a little bit about the life and times of Richard Greer. Who was he? Why did he come to South Carolina? What was going on at our university during Reconstruction? And Professor Bobby Donaldson will give us a brief glimpse into Greener's world. The second piece of background information has to do with the story, how we learned these documents existed, and how we brought them here to Carolina. And our university archivist, Elizabeth West, will describe these events. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Bobby Donaldson. Thank you, Dean Nelly. Today, I want you to pause and to look around this room. Today, in the shadows, literally, of Preston, Desishore, Lieber, Harbor, Thornwell, the Antillman, <laughs> Donaldson <laughs> Calhoun, we come to honor another South Carolina state, a scholar and a citizen, Richard Theodore Greener. Born January 30th, 1844, in Philadelphia, Greener grew up in Boston, attended Oberlin and Phillips Academy before entering Harvard. While at Harvard, Greener studied history, political ethics, metaphysics, and won prizes for oratory, elocution, and composition. He graduated, as we know, with honors from Harvard in 1870, becoming Harvard's first known African-American graduate. An acclaimed writer and public intellectual, he served as a teacher and administrator in Philadelphia, in Washington, D.C., and also as a journalist. In 1871, an admirer of Richard Greener said, quote, he is brilliant as an orator and accurate as a scholar. Greener undoubtedly knew that in 1868, African American leaders offered a redevised state constitution. He undoubtedly knew that in February of 1873, African Americans were appointed to serve on the Board of Trustees of the University of South Carolina. He undoubtedly knew that in July of 1873, the university was open to African Americans. He undoubtedly knew that many criticized this experiment as, quote, an egregious spot, one that caused degradation and ruin to this university. He undoubtedly knew that on October the 7th, 1873, Henry Hayne, the Secretary of State of South Carolina, enrolled in the medical school, prompting the resignation of white members of the faculty. He knew this. On October the 10th, he received a letter from the Board of Trustees asking of his interest to serve on the faculty of the university. On October the 14th, 1873, 140 years ago, yesterday, Richard T. Greener wrote a letter back to the chair of the board. He says the following, yours of the 10th instance asking whether I would accept the professorship of modern language of the State University is received. In reply, I would say that I have just commenced my law studies in the above office, and under ordinary circumstances, should be unwilling to interrupt them. But if the Board of Trustees think that I may be of any service to them in the new career of usefulness they are marking out for the university, I should feel honored by the selection, and would endeavor to sustain, to the best of my ability, their efforts in maintaining the high character of the Honor University, October 14, 1873. Green arrived on campus in the middle of November of 1873. He was 29 years old, the youngest member of the faculty, the only African-American member of the faculty. He taught metaphysics 
logic, Greek, Latin, constitutional history. The governor of the time, Daniel Chamberlain, described him as a gentleman of varied opinions, cultivated and refined. Between May of 1875 and November of 1875, Richard Greener spent a great deal of time in this very building. In the summer of 1875, a visitor came and was given a tour by Greener. And this is what he said. I paid a visit to the South Carolina University today and was taken through the principal buildings by Professor R. T. Greener. These buildings, although not in good repair, retain an ancient grandeur and classical appearance, comporting with the institution of learning for within whose walls have come great statesmen. The most classic of all the buildings is the library, containing 30,000 volumes of rare, ancient, and valuable books of art, science, and literature. It is admirably arranged and under the present care of Professor Green, who, in the great love he has for dusty volumes containing the wisdom of the sages of the world, was driven to voluntarily assume the charge in the absence of an appointed library. While on the staff here, Greener enrolls in the university's law school in October of 1874. He receives a law degree on December the 13th, 1876. He is admitted to practice law on December the 20th, 1876. While doing this, he gives speeches around the state in support of the Republican Party here at Bethel Avenue Church, the first Calvary Baptist Church. Mr. Mayor, in this fall of 1876, he campaigned for mayor of the city of Columbus. But he also, that very same year, goes before Congress. He goes before Congress to testify about the racial violence that he witnessed and experienced. Racial violence led in part by Brigadier General Martin Witherspoon Garrett, the brother of John Hillary Garrett. Garrett whose portrait behind me was dedicated at this university in 1963. The university closed on January, June 7, 1877 by a joint resolution of the General Assembly. Greener returns to Washington to serve as Dean of the Law School at Howard University. He later serves in diplomatic roles under the administration of William McKinley, and later goes on to continue his work as a public intellectual. But I'd like to conclude by one of Greener's last visits to this campus. It was in November of 1907. He was called to speak at Allen University and Benedict College. But while here in town, he came over to his old homestead. He visited Lever College, and he came into this building. He wanted to see the collection one more time. But the librarian who saw him thought that he was a white person. And he pretended that he was a white person. Until a gentleman on a stair putting books on the shelf saw him and came down. He was another African American librarian whose name was Robert Perry. The students called him Literary Bob. He was custodian, but also a librarian. He knew exactly who the visitor was. He rushed to him, and Greener whispered, no names, <laughs> no names. The librarian looked at Greener and said, do you know him? He said, yes. I passed across years ago when I was doing research in this library. Greener then leaves Columbia and goes to Orangeburg. Within days, he opens the state newspaper. And the state newspaper writes about a famous Negro making an appearance, a reappearance, at the University of South Carolina. And apparently, literary Bob could not keep a secret. <laughs> <laughs> he was very proud of Greener and told the world. And today, you will have a great understanding of why we are extremely proud of this path-breaking 
scholar on our campus. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. I um, am absolutely thrilled to have all of you here uh, to break these documents as we bring them home to the University of South Carolina. I'm going to tell you a bit about what it means as an archivist to have this material for you here and the journey that the documents took in, in coming here today. An archivist's duty is to collect historic materials preserve them and make them accessible for researchers. Our collections aren't perfect. There are gaps, missing pieces, that we constantly seek in order to more fully document the history and the culture of a university, a community, a state. Sometimes these missing pieces are passed down very carefully through generations until they come to us. Sometimes they are rediscovered in a grandparent's closet. And sometimes, as in this case, they appear in wonderful moments of serendipity. In 2009, Rufus McDonald was part of a crew that was demolishing an abandoned house in Chicago. An old trunk that had been left in the attic was to be destroyed along with the house. Mr. McDonald opened the trunk and I am deeply grateful that he did so. Without his curiosity, without his realization that there were old documents in there that should be saved, we would not be here today. In March of 2012, the Chicago Sun-Times ran an article on his discovery. <coughs> the reporter contacted my co colleague in the law library, Dr. Michael Mounter, who wrote his dissertation on the life of Richard Greener. Dr. Mounter quickly notified me of the discovery, and I even more quickly notified Dean McNally and uh, Dr. Bobby Donaldson as well. One month later, Bobby and I were in Chicago meeting with Mr. McDonald and examining the documents. I can't adequately express how thrilled I was to unroll Richard Greener's diploma and see the University of South Carolina seal right there on it. This wasn't just any collection item. I was holding my holy grail of university history. <laughs> Since joining the South Carolina Library in 1995, I have always, always wanted to find, above all else, a diploma from one of the African American graduates of the Reconstruction University. Only 21 diplomas were issued, and we had yet to acquire one. The Reconstruction University is not as well documented as other eras in USC history, and some, it was very brief, only four years, and some materials were actually destroyed intentionally when the university reopened in 1880 as an all-white institution once again. So the odds of finding one of these was was very, they were very low. The fact that the diploma and the law license belonged to Richard Greener made the discovery even more thrilling. After our return from Chicago, it was up to Dean McNally to bring in the donations needed to acquire the materials. And I applied just a little bit of pressure, <laughs> as he can well tell you. <laughs> um, so just a short time later, in August, Dean McNally succeeded, and Dr. Donaldson and I flew back to Chicago to bring home Greener's USC diploma and his South Carolina law license. After undergoing conservation treatments, these symbols of a brief but significant part of USC's history are now ready to join the collections of the South Carolinian Library. I want to thank Dean McNally and Dr. Bonson for assisting me in that, and uh, who put too much pressure on me. Um, but the, as I said, this was my holy grail of USC history. This was it. It was phenomenal to hold that diploma, to unroll it, and see it 
what I had wanted for the collections, for the university for so long, because of this often maligned portion of the university's history. For so long, it was considered a stain on the university's history that African Americans attended the university for those four brief years. But now, with additional research and bringing materials like this back to the library, we can really shine a light on how wonderful and important that time period was at the University of South Carolina. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the USC alumnus and former student body president who provided tremendous help in bringing Reader's documents home to Carolina, Columbia's mayor, the Honorable Stephen Benjamin. some reason I went to Thomas Cooper Library. And, uh, of all the many uh, years I've been intrigued by Richard T. Greener, his impact on the libraries here in Carolina Library, I had no idea why I went to Thomas Cooper. Uh, the, um, the librarians, just as they have the last 26 years I've been in Columbia, looked at me very curiously as I walked in that library. I there might be a report in the state newspaper or the, the Gamecock as uh, the uh, locally famous Negro scene in the library. <laughs> only, only, only for the third or fourth time in 26 years. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Chase a bit of a laugh at that. You can, can relate. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is a pleasure and an honor uh, to be here with each of you uh, today, uh, because I, I see myself as the legacy of Richard T. Greener. Um, I've been intrigued uh, by Professor Greener um, every day since I uh, first got on this horseshoe in, in uh, August and September of, of 1987. Intrigued by the history and the story of this man who came uh, to the South still in the very early days of this very young federal republic. And it's, it's often such a challenge to think of, uh, of, of this world in that context, depending on which you consider the birth of, uh, of the United States of America in 1776 or 1789, whatever, whatever you look at, 1787. Uh, we were still very young, a nation, a young nation going through many major fits and starts, less than a quarter of a century later. Supreme Court ruled in Plessy versus Ferguson that separate but equal is the law of the land. We would, in 27 years, begin the 20th century when W.B. Du Bois uh, is another well-known intellectual and uh, occasionally the rival of Richard T. Greener uh, characterized the problem of the 20th century would be the, would be the problem of the color line. And we did embark on a long and often dark uh, and often triumphant century for this nation uh, that once again, 90 years after Greener came, we opened the doors once again to Monty Anderson and Solomon and began what I believe has been this university's great renaissance that has been capped off over the last several years uh, with achievement after achievement after achievement under the leadership of Harris and Patricia Bastides. So this is one of me uh, that uh, I am proud to have played an active role in making, so making it happen. Elizabeth says an active role, that, that means something short of a check or two as well, <laughs> which, um, which is something uh, that um, I, do, uh, I do with a great sense of pride and honor. Uh, on behalf of the, the people of our city, on behalf of my family, uh, I look forward to uh, watching the story of, of Richard T. Greener grow and uh, hoping it provides as much inspiration to other students who come through here, other people who come through here, and provides a window into uh, the possibilities of, of, of a great democratic nation, the wealthiest and most powerful democratic nation in the history of the world. It's powerful. What, what's possible when people believe big, when they think big, when the franchise is extended to all Americans and everyone has a say 
and how uh, their country goes. We can do incredible things in incredibly challenging times, and I firmly believe that. So it's an honor to be here uh, and a pleasure to be here. And I'm so proud again to, uh, to be a game cop. Thank you. Negotiations. Uh, in closing, let me say the University of South Carolina and the 
city of Columbia have a shared history. Uh, we always have, uh, and we do as well, even uh, with the hardship of this particular week. University and the city will remain uh, united. We are particularly proud to have uh, a mayor who served as a student a body president. I bet he visited the library at least five or maybe six times. <laughs> We're so proud of you, Mayor Benjamin. So uh, we'll continue to stick together, the university and a great city, through times of tragedy and through times of triumph. And that's what life is. And in fact, this week we've had tragedy, and today we have a triumph as well. But I'm delighted uh, to uh, welcome these uh, wonderful new members of the University of Community, a diploma and a law license of a gentleman who uh, might have been uh, left to, the, uh, to the, uh, the pile of the obscure were it not for uh, a little luck, a great deal of hard work, and into the future. Let this, let this be far more than that. Let this be a clarion call uh, that, uh, that the university has had dark days, but as we look forward, and I wish I, by the way, a, another great place for this portrait, if I didn't want it back so badly, it would be right above this mantle. Here <laughs> yes, you are, Mr. Gary over there. But we'll let that one go. We can't reject history, but we'll learn from it. So, uh, welcome to the university. To, for those of you from the community, let's go out and have a wonderful day and, and be inspired by these uh, great new documents. Have a great day. Thank you so much for being here.